Interested in learning about wine, but not sure where to start? You're in the right place. Welcome to the Cork and Fizz Guide to Wine podcast. I'm your host, Haley Bullman, and I'm so glad you're here. I'm a wine enthusiast turned wine educator and founder of the Seattle-based wine tasting business, Cork and Fizz. It is my goal to build your confidence in wine by making it approachable and lots of fun. You can expect to learn everything from how to describe your favorite wine to what to pair with dinner tonight and so much more. Whether you're a casual wine sipper or a total cork dork like myself, this podcast is for you. So grab yourself a glass and let's dive in. Welcome back to the Cork and Fizz Guide to Wine podcast. Today, we are exploring the question, what if science could perfectly replicate a bottle of Grand Cru Burgundy so our grandkids' grandkids could discover exactly what a 2020 vintage tasted like? This is the idea that initially sparked author Stephen Lane's latest novel, Jupiter's Blood. In Jupiter's Blood, an American wine expert, Dante Lombardi, is struggling to come to terms with his best friend's suicide. His world is further upended when his ex, Dr. Claire Durant, introduces him to a synthetic lab-made wine that she's developed. It's called Replevino, and it can pass as one of the finest wines produced by the world's best winemakers, but at a fraction of the cost. Now, when Claire and her company's Vino Code disappear, however, Dante must put his feelings aside and rush to Europe to find her. But Dante isn't the only one looking for Claire as she pursues her own agenda to pop the cork on the traditional world of wine. So, too, is a ruthless wine counterfeiter. In a race across Europe, Dante must rely on his French and Italian wine industry connections, partner with new allies and old adversaries, and plumb the depth of his memory cellar to find Claire. Now that's pretty darn exciting, isn't it? And I've read this book and it is good. I am so excited today to be talking to the author, Stephen Lane, who is also quite the wine expert. So don't worry, he's not just writing wine thrillers with whatever <laughs> random wine knowledge he has. He's a French wine scholar, Italian wine scholar, Spanish wine scholar, and a Canadian wine scholar. He's also the only North American invited to join the Champagne Academy in France and is in the process of taking his WSET Level 4 diploma, which is a precursor to the Master of Wine program. So listen in to hear more about Stephen's story and for a very interesting discussion on synthetic wine and all of his wine novels. And don't worry, we will not be giving away any spoilers for the book. So you can listen to the podcast before you read. Thanks for joining me. Oh, thanks for having me. Fantastic. This is great. <laughs> yeah, I'm very excited. I love the book. I was very oh, intrigued. I, I mean, I love the connection with the wine. Obviously, that's always fun to have all of that interspersed. Like, I've read a lot of wine books, but never like a fictional, you know, story, but with so much wine intertwined. So that was really fun. It's a new thing, my niche. So hopefully it catches yeah. on. <laughs> yes, I love it. Well, yeah, I kind of wanted to start there because I think that's a fun place to start of like, you know, you're an accomplished author and then a wine expert. And I love that you kind of combined two of what I'm guessing are some of your favorite things. Which came first, the writing or the wine? Or did they kind of like develop in tandem together? Well, first and foremost, I'm not a big fan of the, of the term wine expert. I've studied wine. Yes, I'm a uh, wine scholar. I'm doing my diploma right now. But I've learned the more you learn about wine, the more you realize you don't know anything. It's oh, a very so humbling true. experience. There's so much to know. I mean, hundreds of thousands of wineries out there. It's just just too much to know. So when people say I'm a wine expert, I kind of shudder. <laughs> Maybe like a, a wine enthusiast, or we could call you a wine scholar because you've got plenty of wine go. scholar. Wine uh... scholar, wine enthusiast. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds better than alcoholic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, no, I do. I definitely try. Uh, definitely combine my passions. So writing, wine, but also travel. I mean, yeah. all my books take place around the world globally. So I love doing that. And a lot of the places that I, that I write about, I've been to most of them actually. So I, I do combine the the traveling into that, like the Japanese concept of ikigai, right? If you can do what you love, do what you're good at, do do, and then get paid for it, then life is good. So yeah. But in terms of what came first, no chicken egg, chicken and egg here. It was definitely the the writing. I started writing, God, in my twenties, 
but I didn't really have a niche back then. I didn't really have know what I wanted to write about. So the first novel was a, a psychological thriller, and the second novel was a religious conspiracy thriller. And then I met Joel Peterson, the winemaker at Ravenswood, at a wine tasting in London, and he talked to me about Phylloxera and the book The Botanist and the Vintner, which I read, and thought, wow, what a great story idea that could be. What if Phylloxera came back, and all of a sudden, that became a big issue in the wine industry? So that's where the story idea came from. And once I wrote one wine story, more and more ideas came to me. And yeah, here we are. Yeah, I love it. Was wine always just kind of like a hobby on the side or what what made you go to that wine tasting? Uh, I really fell into wine. I was working at a hotel here in London in banqueting. And one of the jobs was to process a lot of the wine orders for the banquet guests. So guests would write to us and say, or fax us back then and say, this is what we want to have for the wine on our tables. And I'd process the orders, give it to the wine waiters, and they would serve the wine on a night. Almost a year into their job, my boss came to me and said, Steve, you've got to update the wine list. So all of a sudden I was responsible for a wine list that did over 25 million pounds worth of sales a year. So I quickly met all the suppliers, started doing wine tastings, and then started getting invited out to uh, the champagne houses and the wineries in Spain, Portugal, France, and just fell in love with it. Wow, what a great way to get into wine. Just like... It was a really good way. It was trial by fire, though. I remember the very first wine tasting I did with a group of people. I did the reds first and then the whites, and I was somehow able to convince them that that was a better way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you sound sure of yourself enough in the wine world, I think people will be like, oh... This is just yeah. a brilliant new concept. Okay. <laughs> yeah, cleanse the palate with white wine after the reds. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, they, they were happy with the wines chosen and it all went well. But yeah, I learned a lot by trial and error for sure. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> I noticed in the story, so as we talked about, you know, the stories are, you know, wine-centered, or at least, you know, wine is a topic on there and you use a lot of wine terminology and explain it. I really liked that where it was like, you would say something and it wouldn't just be like, it's this, okay, moving on. It was, oh, what does this mean? And sometimes it's the characters asking it, or sometimes it's just a little bit of a deeper explanation. Is it kind of your goal that both wine enthusiasts and people who are new to wine would enjoy these books? Yes, absolutely. So obviously, uh, when people call me a wine expert, I need to know what I'm talking about. So people with their WSET or Wine Scholar Guild certifications or winemakers read what I'm writing, it has to be accurate. I've read books in the past where somebody describes something or says something and it's not accurate, and it, it does throw you off. Yeah. It's obviously very hard to do that for, I mean, 100,000 words, all these chapters, all the scenes, uh, but you have to make an effort, of course. So yeah, I do want people to approach it if they if they like wine or if they don't know anything about wine at all. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. It's really a balance, though, because you've got to find this balance of, I mean, everything in the wine is fascinating to me and the wine industry is fascinating to me. But I mean, I could talk for 10 pages just on phylloxera, but does somebody want to read 10 pages of phylloxera? So as a writer, you've always got to ask yourself, what's driving the story? What's great information that drives a story that's relevant? And maybe a bit of info dumping here and there just for fun. But yeah. you've really got to drive the story. Otherwise, people get you get bogged down. Yeah, no, I, I definitely felt that there were times when like, I can remember when like, yeah, they were traveling and you were like listing some of the Burgundy crews, you know, yeah. and it's like, you weren't saying exactly what they were. So it was almost like it was a little tidbit for those enthusiasts out there that like, were familiar with those. But then yeah. earlier, you had explained what does crew mean, you know, and, yeah. you know, what is that? And where did, I think that was when, when they were in Bordeaux. So it's like, you know, not quite the same, but like, what are the the Grand Cruz or whatnot? And so I like that it's kind of that, that combination of like, we'll tell you what this is. So you know what we're talking about. And then I'm also going to throw in some other things. So the wine enthusiasts are like, oh, cool, cool, cool. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's funny, because I've, I've had some some of the wine enthusiasts out there say, Oh, I'm not sure if it's it's too in depth. People who don't understand wine might not get it. But I've never had somebody who doesn't get wine write to me or say, I don't get it. So I think they do. I give my readers a lot of credit. I think they're smarter than I would like to think sometimes in terms of writing. So like I don't need to over explain things. People get it, they'll visualize, they'll make the connections. And if there really is something that they don't know, a lot of, a lot of time you just skip over it, right? If you're reading a text and it's dense scientific text, it doesn't, the details don't matter sometimes. So you just right. I mean, over. yeah, you're there, you're there for the story. And if, yeah, there's plenty of times I've read a book and just like, been like, yep. Okay. Moving on. I don't need to, <laughs> I don't need to know that. Just a quick reminder. If you are not on my mailing list yet, what are you waiting for? I would love for you to join. When you do, you'll get a free shopping guide that has 15 of my favorite wines under $15. Head to corkandfizz.com, scroll down to the bottom, and there'll be a little section where you can join the mailing list. I send out a weekly newsletter filled with wine tips, recommendations, special offers, and so much more. Now, let's get back to the show. 
But yeah, well, let's dive into your latest book, Jupiter's Blood. Let's just start with where did the idea for the story come from? So similar to uh, Root Cause, when I met uh, Joel Peterson at a wine tasting, I met a Burgundian winemaker at a wine dinner in Singapore, where I was working at the time. I worked in Singapore for a few years. Uh, and then at a wine dinner over there, I met a Burgundian winemaker. And we were just chatting about all sorts of stuff. And we talked about uh, classical music and how wouldn't it be nice if you could hear classical music as it was meant to be heard back in the day. Now, of course, you can play on old instruments in the original halls, but it's, it's not quite the same, is it? So we will we'll never capture that exact sense of wonder. And same with wines. Once a vintage is done, it's done. You can't go back. So it's very rare for people to taste a pre or a wine. So we started talking about that, and that got me thinking, like, well, there's actually a lot of synthetic stuff out there already. So that's where the idea came from, essentially. And I'd always wanted to write a book about climate change, but I never really had a full story idea yeah. about climate change in the wine industry. So I thought that would make a great backdrop to it. And I think a lot of the scenes will be familiar to readers where there's, there's smog in the air from the fires, but they're also all wearing masks. So during COVID, of course, we all wore masks. And I wrote this during COVID. <laughs> I was wondering about that because when they did mention the masks at first, I was like, well, is it is it COVID <laughs> reason? Or <laughs> they also mentioned the multiple times the wildfires. And I'm like, yeah, I am yeah. I'm not in California. I'm in uh Washington state. Okay, yeah. But we definitely had to wear masks a few times when the the smoke kind of blew in. And so yeah. yeah, it was very, very familiar with that. Yeah, when, when I worked at the uh, the winery in British Columbia during COVID, we had fires that, yeah down south, but also in British Columbia, and the, the sky would just be orange sometimes, and yeah, you couldn't go out and you couldn't breathe, and it was terrible. <laughs> yeah, I like that tie-in, and it did feel very real because I'm like, yeah, I've definitely, I've definitely lived that, and so I think the, the like the thing that like was so curious to me while I was reading this, I kept like that idea of synthetic lab made wine. I find that very sure, fascinating. Fine, right? <laughs> <laughs> like I had so many thoughts on it as soon as we read it. And so, you know, I know as an author, you do a lot of research and you did kind of mention just earlier that the synthetic stuff does exist. Does synthetic lab made wine currently exist? Is it possible? I do reference in a book uh, throughout the story, there's a couple of companies already out there trying to make synthetic wine. So for instance, there's um, the, the AVA winery in San Francisco, they make synthetic wine. They're not producing anything great right now. And I, I talk about that in the book. So I don't think uh, anybody has to worry too much. But if you think about it, I mean, look at the proliferation of synthetic meat. You've got Omni pork making meatless pork. You've got finless making meatless fish. You've got Impossible Burgers. You've got Beyond Burgers. So there's all these companies out there making synthetic food already. So wine is just one of the next categories, really, when it comes down to it. I mean, it, I talk about this in a book as well, and also in Dragon by my previous book. Wine, what is it? It's, it's water, it's acid, it's alcohol, it's sugars and phenolic compounds, right? So these are all things we can measure, we can identify, and they're available to us. They're, they're replicable. So if you can break something down to its core components, you can build something back up again. So in your book, and kind of like what you said, like the inspiration for even writing it was that idea of like, how can we replicate a wine that we might never be able to get again once that vintage is gone, right? Like the pure idea of actually replicating a wine. And it got me thinking that like when we're talking about the synthetic meat, right, you're trying to make the meat without meat, right? You're basically trying to replace. And there's a couple of reasons, right, for the fact that people don't eat meat. Also, climate change, you know, it's probably better for the climate to, you know, make it there than to, you know, have cows and, you know, all that. But I'm curious, what do you think the motivation is for these companies making synthetic wine? Well, I mean, as you say, climate change is a big is a big factor, of course. Um, land cost and um, cost of irrigating and ag cost of agriculture. So if you can do everything in a lab, you don't have so much overhead. You don't have to deal with um, inconsistent yields every year. I'm based in the UK right now in London, and the wineries here have very inconsistent yields year to year. Some, some summers are great, some are terrible. And one year they might not have a harvest at all. So it, it really varies where if you make things in a lab, you can do things consistently year round and also not, not even on a schedule. You just you can just make it again and again and again because vines, of course, are I can only grow once a year. <laughs> so make grapes once a year, whereas labs can make something every month, really. <laughs> so, so I think there's a lot of attraction yeah. for, for companies to look at doing that. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So what I liked a lot in the book is that, you know, first you have in Jupiter's Blood, the protagonist, who's a master sommelier, a master of wine, aka, you know, a pretty, pretty big wine expert. I think we could probably label him that. And he grapples with, you know, with his opinions on synthetic wine. To him, it's just not the same. And I kind of like, for me, like definitely starting out and reading this, 
I was on his side. I was just like, I can't explain fully, but I, I'm just like, it just doesn't feel the same. And yet at the same time, you have another character or multiple characters, right? The people creating it. So Vivian being one of them who isn't big into the wine world and she helped create this synthetic wine that is a major proponent for it. And she talks all these benefits of climate change and then also being able to replicate a wine that we'll never get to try again. And, you know, what happens if 200 years from now they can't grow grapevines? Like they could still have wine. Would you rather it not exist at all? And I thought it was just cool that you could write both of those sides, right? I mean, you, those, both those characters came from your brain, right? So you had to <laughs> you had to do both of those. And so I'm curious, what are your thoughts on synthetic wine? <laughs> so, well, my thoughts evolved. Um, so, of course, there's a lot of research. And I, again, as a wine enthusiast, when I first heard of the concept, I thought of the concept. I thought, no, absolutely not. But then as I did more and more research, as Vivian argues, there's a lot of good reasons for it. But then Dante argues against it. And the idea of their, their arguments and then having totally opposing views is that through the course of the story, which happens, one of them comes to the conclusion that hey, actually it's not too bad. And that's Dante. And he realizes there is a place in the world for synthetic wine. And Vivian equally, who had no clue about the wine world or the industry and why wine was so important to so many people, gains a real deep appreciation of it. So and you can kind of see that flick of the switch in Bordeaux after she's taken part in the Bordeaux Marathon at Chateau Pichon Longueville, where she realized like, wow, wine is so much more than, yeah, just a liquid. Yeah. So it's so interesting because like, yeah, I struggled with it because I think one of my favorite things about wine is the story behind it. And it doesn't feel like a synthetic made wine could have a story, right? But of course we talked about like one of the things is that synthetic could save wine if climate change completely destroyed the ability to grow it. And so- I think we've kind of already talked about this a little bit, but I'm just like putting it in more like clear state, like could yep. synthetic wine truly replace real wine? Like say in a world where climate change doesn't allow us to grow Riesling anymore, like yeah. would you want to drink a lab made Riesling or not drink it at all? This podcast is sponsored by Vochill. When you're enjoying a glass of wine, temperature matters. And you don't need to be a wine expert to know this. You know this the minute you realize you forgot to put the bottle of wine in the fridge, and now you're stuck with lukewarm Sauvignon Blanc that is the opposite of refreshing. You know adding ice cubes will just water the wine down, but it seems like it's your only option. Not anymore. I want to introduce you to one of my favorite wine gadgets, Vochill. This gadget is as simple as it is elegant. It will keep wine perfectly chilled in your own wine glass. No more clunky metal or plastic tumblers or ice in your wine. While this gadget is an absolute must during the summer months, I don't enjoy wine without it from June to September. It's also incredibly useful for those days when you're craving a glass of white or rosé, but you don't want to wait for the bottle to chill in the fridge. Vochill offers a stemmed and stemless chiller in multiple colors, so you're bound to find one that's perfect for you. They also make the perfect gift. I should know. I got one for my mom at Christmas a couple years ago, and she loves it. Head to vochill.com, that's V-O-C-H-I-L-L.com, to get your perfect wine chiller, and don't forget to use code CORKANDFIZZ for 15% off your order. This podcast is sponsored by the Cork Crew Virtual Wine Club. Interested in trying new wines, but not sure where to start? Or maybe you've been listening to this podcast for a while and you love the idea of tasting wine live with me. If that's you, come join my Cork Crew Virtual Wine Club and you'll get to sip wine with me twice a month while I help you find new favorite wines. The Cork Crew is not your ordinary wine club. This is a community of people who are passionate about exploring new flavors, learning about different wine styles, and having fun along the way. And the best part about this club, Purchasing the wine is completely optional, plus all events are recorded, and you have access to the full library of recordings as a court crew member, so you can always catch up if you can't make it live. Oh, and did I mention it's virtual, which means you get to do all of this from the comfort of your sofa in your PJs. No need to worry about driving in crappy traffic, finding a designated driver, or spending an arm and a leg on a taxi. Want to give it a try without the commitment? You're in luck. Right now, I'm offering a free class pass to anybody who wants to try out the Court Crew Virtual Wine Tasting Club. With this pass, you'll be able to join a Court Crew event of your choosing. 
no strings attached. I don't need your credit card. I don't need you to sign up for anything. You'll be my guest. Simply head to corkandfizz.com slash free class pass to get your class pass and be one step closer to becoming a member of the best wine tasting club around, the Cork Crew. I can't wait to see you there. Now let's get back to the show. Well, in many respects, we already are drinking lab-made wine, but it's it's a matter of degree, right? I mean, yeah. you, you look at cultured yeast versus ambient yeasts. I mean, cultured yeasts are very are scientifically made, essentially, and, and they're 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 cultured. Same with all the additions we put into wine, the sugar that's added to wine, the tartaric acid that's added to wine, and most wineries have labs in them where there's constant testing of pH levels, alcohol levels. I mean, everything really. So it's just a matter of degree. So we're already drinking lab-assisted made wine t- to a large extent. We're not drinking purely natural wine. So what your comfort level with that degree is going to be up to you in future, if we even know. Because right now, a lot of people, I think, would be very surprised at how much science is behind wine and how many additions and changes and things are done to wine before it actually reaches them at their dinner table. Right. No, I mean, it's very true. And it definitely depends on like where you're getting a wine from, right? Like most people buying wine from the grocery store, that's going to be far more, you know, made in the lab. Or even I remember reading in Bianca Bosker's Cork Door. It was one of my first wine books I ever read. And she talked about visiting one of the factories, basically, that makes one of the big wines. She didn't say which wine it was. She wasn't allowed to say that. (laughs) Um, But she did mention how much it was made almost like soda. And I think that would be my biggest concern with like synthetic made wine is if it became like a soda thing where it's like, we're just going to make it the same or make it to what society wants it to taste like. I think one of the things I like about wine, and maybe this is like a little bit of a romantic idea, but that it's kind of not up to us on what it tastes like. And, you know, the winemaker can make some changes, but like based on the climate that year or the terroir or what was going on, like the wine kind of decides what it's going to taste like. And I would worry, like, I think that's my biggest thing of like, I wouldn't want to lose that. I would want, there's like this little mystery or something to the, to the wine. <laughs> well, certainly for vintage wines. Yeah. The wine will change year to year, but then of course a lot of wine producers make and champagne, especially for instance, make their house style where they, they want that same style every single year. And synthetic wine can help make that happen too. I don't think the top shelf of any wine store is going to have any, there's, there's no threat to the premium crew, the, the first growths and the yeah the premium wines. But the bottom shelves, yeah, the Trader Joe wines for sure. Two buck chucks, I mean, why not? Make it, make it synthetically, make it much cheaper. And if people want to drink that, I see it in some ways as a good thing. It's, it's like a, a gateway drug to wine, right? It's a gateway wine. Yeah. People will start at the, at the bottom shelf. And then hopefully in, in future, they'll gain an appreciation as they make more money, as they gain an appreciation, they'll start buying up and they'll level up in their taste. Yeah. Well, because that was another point that I thought was was a good point. I think uh, Vivian probably made it was like the idea that like wine does sometimes feel elitist in order to have some of these high end bottles. You need to be paying hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, and, you know, somebody who doesn't make that kind of money would never get to taste what that high level taste is. And it's like, what if we could replicate that? Well, exactly. Synthetic wine can allow people to do that. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Like almost just make it even more approachable and, and have or have that entry level, like you said, of like, okay, this is very affordable. It's also not, you know, full of pesticides. Like, you know, I think sometimes we would worry about like, you know, the two buck chuck as it is now. But yeah, I think that's another great point of like making it approachable and a place to start. And also, I think to me, my answer to the question is like, it probably never fully replaced wine. No, I don't. Again, I don't think wine, the wine industry is not under threat. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's never going to replace wine altogether. So yeah, yeah exactly. Long time before that happens. But I certainly, I think it provides a lot of opportunity. And yeah. It, and again, I'm not a massive proponent for it. It's not something I would want to see worldwide and globally. But as a writer, I just found it a fascinating subject to explore because you can come down very hard on either side. But both sides have a lot of valid arguments. And that's what I tried to do with exploring that that discussion between Dante and Vivian. No, I absolutely think it made for a great story because it does. It makes you think on it because that's exactly what's going through my mind. I'm like, yeah, I'm totally with Dante on this. And I'm like, no, wait, OK, great point, Vivian. And then, you know, you're following other characters and, and trying to figure out like, OK, how can they make this work in the wine world? Like, how are they going to convince the winemakers that this, you know, is a good thing? And yeah, I really I really enjoyed that in the story. But I know. Jupiter's Blood is not your first wine thriller. No. Can you just give us, I know you talked a little bit about Root Cause, but can you give us a brief introduction to the other wine thrillers that you've written? 
Sure. So root cause is the first one, and it's based on the concept of phylloxera, the louse, the aphid that basically destroyed the world's vineyards in the late 1800s. And it was, yeah, it was, they, they found a resolution to, by, by grafting American rootstock onto, onto vines. So to this day, most vines around the world have American rootstock grafted onto it. So basically plugged into it so they can grow and be aphid uh, phylloxera resistant. So if the phylloxera ever evolved and mutated to be able to attack American rootstock, the world's vineyards would once again be at risk and we'd really be in trouble. So the story explores that idea. So how, how would that happen? Why would it happen? Would somebody intentionally do it? And then the heroes of the story, the protagonists, need to figure out what's going on and stop it before the world's vineyards completely collapse. So the, the tagline for that one is imagine a world without wine, which could happen one day. <laughs> wow, that's even scary. Like I'm like talking about like singing about synthetic wine and like how that could different. Then you're like, what if phylloxera changed and could have destroyed them? I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> And it could happen because it has happened before. So all my stories, I mean, some of the chase scenes might be a little crazy, but all my stories are very much based in reality and in fact, and could happen. And then Dragon Vine is the second wine thriller I wrote. I wrote that while I was based in Hong Kong and Singapore. So that's where the Asian uh, aspect came from. And I just thought, what if there was a, an Asian grape variety that was lost to time and was found again? What could that look like? How would that happen? So it's essentially about a uh, Chinese American family in California who have this vineyard and the father plants all these grapes and then he passes away and the son reluctantly has to take over the vineyard uh, by himself essentially and bring in his first harvest. And he's got all sorts of problems with the neighbors, with the uh, suppliers of his equipment, with a local gang who wants him to counterfeit wine. And it was just a very fun story to write. <laughs> and it takes place in two different timelines, one in California present day and one in ancient China during the time of the first emperor. And believe it or not, the stories do intertwine and eventually come to a, a conclusion together. And they, they do make sense together in the end. Oh, cool. I love it. And then just to clarify, I know I've read this, but just for those that are listening, you know, in case one of those sounds more interesting than the other, these aren't part of a series. So they can be read in any order, right? They can be read in any order. Definitely. Yeah. So there are overlapping characters. So for instance, Vivian Wong first appeared in Dragon Vine, and she's one of the main characters in Jupiter's Blood. Uh, John Haskins from Dragon Vine will appear in my next novel. And then Claude Duval, from Root Cause will appear in my next novel too. So essentially I'm building up this universe of characters and eventually, I haven't thought of the story yet, but eventually I'd like to have a story where they all come together, have that happen together essentially. So yeah, oh, so it's a universe, that. you know, they're, they're completely independent of each other. You read them in whatever order you want. Cool. Okay. So you mentioned your next thriller. That was going to be my next question. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Sure. The working title right now is called Heist Bordeaux. So that I think tells you a lot about what the story is. So it's about a heist in Bordeaux, obviously. And uh, the story idea came to me a little bit when, when I was working at wineries during COVID, one in BC and one in, in Ontario. I did two harvests and I met all these traveling winemakers, these, these people who, who would work in a winery for a season, then take a few months off and then go to the Southern Hemisphere, maybe Argentina or New Zealand, and do another harvest down there. And you just bounce around the world doing harvest. I met this one couple if I recall correctly, a Spanish and Italian couple. And yeah, they just traveled the world making wine at different wineries. I thought it's fascinating. But then I also thought, like, wouldn't that be fascinating if, if they were thieves? And uh, so that's where the story idea came from. Uh, so it's like Point Break meets Ocean's Eleven in the wine industry. So that's the story I'm working on right now. Post-it notes everywhere in my bedroom. So outlining the whole thing. And just it's really coming together well. So I'm quite happy with it. So hopefully that'll be available next year sometime, 2025. Cool. Exciting. I will definitely be on the lookout. That sounds really fun. I love that. I <laughs> love that idea. <laughs> All right. Well, we've made it to the end. I just have my last little, I call it the speed round. Okay. Um, I just, it's fun. I just do it with every guest and it's the speed is more meant to be like, whatever's the first thing that comes to mind. Otherwise these questions, you could end up just like stuck on them for a little while. Cause they're more <laughs> like, what's your favorite? And everybody's like, I hate that. I'm like, I don't care. I'm asking you anyway, yeah. because I think She's it's your favorite fun. child. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I sometimes I ask winemakers like their favorite wine. They're like, dear God, no, <laughs> I'm yeah, not telling. Yeah, it's, hard, it's hard to ask. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it, it changes too. That's yeah. Right. Time, well, maybe so. the version of this would be like, okay, so which one's your favorite book that you've written? You'd be like, yeah. <laughs> no, go away. <laughs> Please. <laughs> okay. So they are wine related. So what is your favorite wine at the moment? Well, I'm doing my diploma, a WSET diploma, and I just wrapped up the fortified wine exam in June. 
And out of all the fortified wines, love Madeira. And I hadn't really tasted a lot of Madeira before. And I just love the, the nuance between them. And you know, just really, really enjoy Madeira. Because it, it's such a versatile drink. You can have it for an aperitif. You can pair it with desserts. You can eat it with food or just have it on its own. So Madeira, yeah, huge fan of Madeira right now. Interesting. I don't know if I've ever tried Madeira myself. I know I've, I've definitely heard of it a lot. Is it more similar to like sherry or port or is it like somewhere in the middle? Kind of somewhere in the middle. There, there's less of a range. There's only, only really like five or six different Madeiras when it comes down to it, as opposed to sherry, which you I mean you get like 20 different sherries yeah. and you know, 15 different ports. So Madeira was much more approachable to study and to learn, I found. <laughs> but I just found that range in particular a little, a little uh, yeah, just nice and just a really, really oh. great wine to drink. So there's a future plan to visit Madeira, hopefully, in the, in the future. Ooh. Yeah, I bet yeah, that'll be really like cool. It's a fascinating island to visit in the history there. Yeah. Well, talking about travel, you've definitely done a lot. So this one might be the hardest question, but what is your favorite wine region that you've ever visited? Yeah, definitely a hard question, but uh, I think I would say Champagne. There's, there's so much history there. And that was one of the first regions outside of Canada where I'm from that I visited. And I visited it with Bollinger. They brought me over from the UK to do a tour and a tasting. And I've been over a few other times, including when I became a member of the Champagne Academy. And I mean, you go into the into the crayer, the cellars made of chalk dug up by the Romans, and it's just incredible. It's yeah. just such an amazing place. And Champagne, again, a very versatile drink and beautiful region. So yeah, so probably Champagne, I would say, is my, my top region. That's very cool. I have to ask you, I'm going to pause our speed round because I'm very curious <laughs> about the Champagne Academy. When I was reading your yeah. bio, uh, you're like the first non-French person or something to be in. Or, first North American. First yes, North American. So. There we go. Because I'm like, at first I thought American. And I'm like, no, he said he's Canadian, Haley. Come on. First North American <laughs> invited. <laughs> Tell me about what is the Champagne Academy? So it was established in 1956 by a group of Champagne houses. So 16 Grand Marc Champagne houses. And their idea at the time was, how do we promote champagne more effectively and get more sales through the UK? So every year, the each champagne house nominates four people secretly, a secret ballot, essentially, in the UK. So from Wales, Scotland, England, Ireland, essentially. And out of those four people, one is eventually selected. So 48 people are nominated. 16 people are selected. They're voted on by the committees. And then 16 of those people will eventually go over to Champagne spend 10 to 12 days visiting all the houses, learning about all the processes and just being wined and dined and having a great time. So I was invited because I'm also a UK citizen. So I'm British yeah. and Canadian. So, and because I worked at a big hotel selling a lot of champagne, they thought, okay, here's a guy who's going to promote champagne the rest of his life. And that's the, that's the idea. We're champagne ambassadors, essentially. Yeah. So that was back in 2006 that I did that. And still probably one of the best trips of my, of my life. It was one of those trips money couldn't buy. And it's just such yeah. an amazing experience. Made some great friends, tasted a lot of great champagnes and learned so much about the history and the people and the culture of champagne. It was just a yeah, great experience. Oh, I can see why you love it. That, yeah. that sounds that sounds <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. But I recently attended an event where I met some people who are going on a Champagne Academy trip this year. And it does look like they've opened it to internet people from all over the place. So people who are based in the UK, but different nationalities. So I don't think it's as purely restricted to the UK nationalities anymore. Well, good. Yeah. Because I mean, I can understand like they want to start somewhere. And, you know, I think yeah. obviously that the connection like UK is one of the biggest markets, but obviously uh, if France, Champagne yeah. wants to continue growing, they're going to want to grow in all the markets. <laughs> yeah. Well, I make, the, I make the joke in root cause. I didn't realize Champagne needed promoting. <laughs> So true, right? We're like, isn't that like the wine we all think of as like the highest end? Yeah, like you don't see advertisements for gold or diamonds generally, but yeah, they need everything needs promoting in some ways, I guess. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I love it. Okay, so on the flip side, now I'm actually thinking maybe this is the hardest question. Wine region you'd like to visit? This is definitely the hardest question. So top of my head quickly, like Georgia, I'd love to go. The history there looks fantastic and the winemaking processes. New Zealand, I was supposed to go, but then COVID struck, so I had to cancel my trip back then. Argentina. So I'd love to visit Mendoza and really explore that region. Italy, all of it, because I've, I've been to Italy a few times, but never to the vineyards. And I'm, I'm an Italian wine scholar now. So there's so much I want to see and explore and experience there. Uh, Madeira, as mentioned, and the Canary Islands. I mean, have you ever seen the, the vineyards in the Canary Islands? I don't think so. No, I've had one or two wines from there, but I don't know if I've seen the vineyards. So essentially, the, some of the islands are covered in this uh, black volcanic stone, like these small little volcanic pebbles. And what they do is they dig out these big concave pits and then plant the vine right in the middle of it. 
So if you Google Canary Islands vineyards and look at what these vineyards look like, it looks like a vineyard on the moon. I mean, it, it's just the most unique, crazy looking thing you've ever seen. So I want to go see these for myself and they'll appear on my next novel. Cool. Okay. How about your favorite wine and food pairing? A nice Carneros Pinot Noir and a salmon steak on a plank. I mean, yeah, something, something like that. So that a few times. Steak with a Malbec or Primitivo or a Cunha Noir, a Cabernet Sauvignon. So, I mean, just, there's so much, right? There's oh, yeah. so many pairings out there. Oh, I know. That's This is, again, this is why it's called the speed run. Because it's like, oh, man, but what about this? And then what about, like, <laughs> I feel like our brains <laughs> are just going to, like, come up with, like, you're like, but this is so good, too. So it's just like, yeah. Yeah. All right. Last one. What is a wine that surprised you lately? So uh, just last week, I went out to Gusbourne Winery here in the UK. It's in Ashford, Kent. It's an hour outside of London. Very easy to get to. And I did a lunch there with my father and a tour. And then they brought out this rosé. And it was just so good. And you wouldn't think English rosé. I mean, you, that's something that you think Provence. Uh, you think a lot of other things before you think to the south of England. Um, but it was just fantastic. And their sparkling wines are great, too. So there's there's so many more wineries um, booming right now in the UK. Things are getting better in terms of the, the production of wine. The, the climate's getting better for it as well. So I think the UK has got a very, very bright future in terms of winemaking. Yeah, I've gotten to enjoy maybe a couple sparkling wines from the UK. I really hope they're, they're able to start exporting more to the U.S. and getting to try these because, yeah, those sparkling wines were delicious. And I mean, you know, talking about climate change and, you know, as the one of the focuses in Jupiter's blood of, you know, I've been told that, like, as it's getting warmer, the U.K. is starting to have a climate that was closer to what champagne was like 100, 200 years ago. Yeah, exactly. And Champagne's getting hotter and hotter now. So yeah. they're, they're they're struggling. And a company like Tete Ange, they have vineyards in the UK now. Yeah, so a lot of yeah. companies see the potential in this area. And I mean, at one point, France and England were joined, right? And then they split and there's got the, you've got the English Channel. But the soil is very similar. The chalk is there in the south of England. So there's, yeah, it's very easy to make sparkling wine in England now for all those reasons. So I think, again, yeah. a very bright future for them. <laughs> Very cool. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining. Thank you for having me, Haley. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah. No, I really enjoyed the book. I recommend anybody go out and check them out if you're a big thriller fan or a wine fan or both, then you definitely you. should. Jupiter's Blood is the the latest one, but the other ones, Root Cause and Dragon Vine, check them out as well. And I'll put links uh, in the show notes for everybody to find them. They're all found on Amazon is probably the best way to, to find them. Yeah. Amazon around the world, Borders, any online store, essentially. Yeah. Cool. Perfect. All right. Well, thanks again for joining, Stephen, and have a great rest of your day. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Cork and Fizz Guide to Wine podcast. Be sure to check out Stephen's books, his latest Jupiter's Blood, along with his previous books, Root Cause and Dragon Vine. Reminder, these are not part of a series, though they do exist in the same world and some of the characters overlap but you can read them in any order. So if there's one of them that stood out to you the most, go check that one out. They're available on Amazon or any of the other large book stores. If you love this episode as much as I did, I'd love it if you could take a quick second to rate it and leave a review. If you know a wine lover in your life that would enjoy this, please share it with them. It would mean the world to me. In next week's episode, I will be introducing you to a wine region you'd probably be surprised to discover that they make wine. Ukraine. We explored this winemaking region in our latest court crew tasting, so I thought it would be fun to give you a little intro here on the podcast. Reminder again, the court crew is my virtual wine tasting club. They a great spot if you're interested in exploring new wines, joining an incredible community of wine lovers, I would love to invite you to join us in the court crew. You can use code WINE101 to get your first month absolutely free. And of course, be sure to come follow me on Instagram at Cork and Fizz. I will answer all of your wine questions. I love getting those in the DMs. Just reach out and let me know. And let me know which book of Stevens you're planning to read first. Cheers! <laughs>